Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about some of the implementation details for our simple RISC-V processor that we've been going over. So as a reminder, this is what our RISC-V processor looks like that supports a subset of the RISC-V instruction set, so just a couple of the ops. And in the past two videos, we've gone over each of the different components um, that's part of this architecture, what they do, um, and how they're uh, connected together. And in the last video, we looked at how our different instructions use these different components and the rough flow of how we go from a program counter pointing to one of these instructions uh, to the final operation and eventual increment to the next instruction. But we've skipped out on some of the lower level implementation details here, right? So how exactly do we go from, you know, all of these black lines to actually controlling things like um, which registers are we accessing, right? And how do we actually work with immediate values? So we're going to be trying to fill in some of those gaps today. Of course, this isn't going to be, you know, an exhaustive detailing of every single one of these control lines and how they're exactly set, but it should give a high level idea of how this works in practice. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And let's talk about some of these missing components. So the first thing we'll detail is how we handle our immediate values. So as a reminder, uh, inside of some of our instructions, we have immediate values. So values that are embedded within the instruction them in themselves. Now our immediate values, of course, are not 32 bits, right? Remember our instructions themselves are only 32 bits. So of course we can't fit a 32 bit immediate value inside of a 32 bit instruction. There'd be no space for things like the op code. So, what exactly do we do here, right? We know that things like our program counter value that we're using along with immediate, um, our program counter is 32 bits, right? And so when we're doing something like a branch or something, um, how do we say add together, right? This 12 bit immediate value in our 32 bit program counter. The same thing goes with some of our address calculation, right? So we have this 12 bit immediate value from our instruction and we have a 32 bit value coming from say a register. So how do we say add these together to calculate say some address? How do we add a 12 bit value to a 32 bit one? And the answer is we don't, right? Uh, what we do is we create a 32 bit value from our 12 bit immediate. And we do this through sign extension. So for example, if it's a positive number, we'll sign extend uh, zero all the way to the MSB. And if it's a, uh, a negative number, we'll sign extend one all the way to the MSB, right? It'll be the exact same value, but now in 32 bits. So now instead of say adding a 32-bit uh, a value with a 12-bit value, now we're just adding two 32-bit values together, right? With this immediate generation block here. And we're gonna rely on this block to know exactly how to treat the bits coming from our uh, uh, co coming from our instruction, right? Uh, different instructions have uh, slightly different formats in terms of their fields, right? So we'll rely on this immediate generation block to do that work for us. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue on. And the next thing we'll talk about is uh, configuring our registers and how we access our register file. So as a reminder here, this is our registers, right? How do we select which ones we're going to use? So we showed these arrows going into our register file, say RS1, RS2, and RD for destination, right? If we're storing something. And each of these different lines here for RS1, RS2, and RD are going to be five bits, right? That five bits because we have 32 different uh, registers to choose from, right? Zero to 31. So we need five bits to be able to index all of them. And those five bits for each of these are coming from our instruction, right? So for example, in an R type instruction here, um, RS2 is going to be bits 24 to 20, RS1 is bits 19 through 15, and RD, or destination register, is bits 11 through seven here, right? So that's how these uh, values in our instruction get mapped to our registers. So over here in RS1, RS1 is that signal right here is getting the bits 19 through 15 from our instruction, right? Now, as a reminder, not every single one of our instructions uses, say, RS1, RS2, and RD, right? Not everything stores something to our register file, right? So for example, if we have a store instruction, so we're storing something out to memory, that doesn't write anything to our register file, right? But we still have the 32 bits of that instruction here. So what ends up happening? So remember on the other side of our registers, right? We might be reading out R1 and R2, 
But remember, R2 gets selected uh, based on a multiplexer, right? That selects between an immediate value and the result coming from our register file, right? So at the end of the day, that selection determines what is actually going on in terms of being calculated there. Um, so we have multiplexers to make sure that we're selecting the right thing here uh, for instructions that say have different formats. So uh, say we have an immediate value up here in our, in our top 12 bits um, of our instruction instead of you know func7 and rs2 like we have for an r-type instruction. Okay. So let's go ahead and continue on, and let's talk about configuring our ALU, our arithmetic logic unit, the thing that does our computations inside of our architecture. So we need to configure our ALU to perform the different operations that we support. So as a reminder, our ALU, we said, supports uh, doing an AND operation, an OR operation, addition, and subtraction. But how do we tell it what to do? Well, we tell it what to do through these control signals, right? And we're going to have a four bit control signal that goes into our ALU. So we'll say that uh, 0000, zero, zero, zero uh, says that this is an AND, so the ALU is going to do an AND of the two inputs. 0001 zero, 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 will do an OR of the two inputs. 0010 zero, 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 will do addition. And 0110 one, zero, will do subtraction, right? Uh, so that's what the, the four different uh, uh, bit patterns that this 4-bit ALU control will take on. So why exactly do we have four bits here? Well, each of these bits controls uh, something different, right? So um, our first bit controls whether or not our input A is going to be inverted. Uh, our second bit here, starting from left to right, um, says whether or not B is going to be inverted, so our input 2. And then our last two bits is going to be our op selection, right? So the last two bits, so our LSB and the adjacent bit. So zero, zero means that it's an and. Zero, one means that we're going to do an or. One, zero means that we're going to do an add. And then we see that one, zero also means we're going to do a subtraction. So as a reminder, the typical way that we do subtraction, right, in this digital arithmetic, is through two's complement addition, right? So instead of doing subtraction, what we'll do is we'll add a negative number, which is why we have one of these invert bits set here. So we're inverting B and adding it uh, to A here, right? This input one, right? So we're adding A plus negative B in the case of subtraction. Now, all of these decisions here about, you know, how we got to these bit patterns and what these bits represent, they're implementation details for this particular ALU. And this one is based on the one in the computer organization and design uh, book that covers RISC-V. So that's where this particular design comes from. Now, where exactly uh, do these four bit control values come from? Um, well, this comes from this ALU control block down here, which is fed from two places. So how do we determine which operation an ALU is going to perform? Well, it's going to be a decision based on two things. One is going to be the ALU op signal. So let me just minimize my camera for a second. So ALU op, uh, and this is coming from that control block we have that sends all these signals out across the processor and says what to do. The second part that's going to determine what operation we're going to perform is based on the func7 and func3 fields of our instruction, right? So that total of 10 bits here. So we have a total of 12 bits that's going to determine these four bit ALU control signals, right? So we'll use a combination of these two things to determine, uh, you know, what exactly operation are we going to perform? That what exactly does ALU op uh, uh, represent? Well, it represents the class of instruction that we're working with. So we have more than one instruction that uses the ALU. It's not just our R-type instructions. Things like our memory instructions also use the ALU, right? So uh, for address calculation, right? So this ALU opt just says, what type of instruction do we have? Do we have a branch, like a branch of equal instruction where we need to, you know, compare two numbers, see if they're equal and set that zero flag? Um, do we have just one of these normal R-type arithmetic instructions or do we have an address calculation? So that's what ALU op is saying. And this func7 and func3 is to say, you know, hey, for these R-type instructions, how do we determine if I'm doing an and, an or, an add, or a subtract? Okay, so that's a bit about how we configure our arithmetic logic unit. There's, of course, a lot more details that we could go into here, but we'll leave it there for today. 
Now, what about the remaining signals, right? We have all of these signals controlling, say, our multiplexers, um, you know, whether or not we're doing a branch, things like that. And even the things inside of, say, that ALU control block or a control block in general or, you know, inside of our actual ALU. Well, this really all goes back to one of the prerequisites to computer architecture, which is logic design. So the basic idea here is we take you know, the, these input bits that we have. So we have, say, our instruction, which is telling us what to do, right? And what we do is we create a truth table, right? Where we take the mapping of these inputs, so maybe the opcode um, of our, uh, from our instruction, and we feed that to our control. And then we create a truth table that says, you know, for these different bit patterns of this opcode, I want to create these output signals here. So we create a truth table, which is that mapping, of inputs to outputs. And what we can do is we can optimize that and just turn that into logic gates. So things like AND gates and OR gates. And that's what's really inside these things, like in, inside of this control block or that ALU control block. And it's really what's inside of things like our ALU as well, right? It's really just uh, these gates that we you know, found which ones to use based on these truth tables. So we use this to say map our instructions to the control signals and things like our control signal, that ALU op signal, as well as that func7 and func3 field to figure out what ALU control signal we're actually going to send to the ALU itself, right? Those four bits. Okay, so that's gonna go ahead and do it for today. Um, we'll go ahead and leave it there. There's of course a lot more we can talk about in terms of the practical implementation details for a processor like this, but we'll leave that largely for the uh, bytes of architecture series where we're going to be covering the implementation of these styles of processors. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.